So when we look at amalgam fillings, this has always been notorious for toxicity and very closely linked to the dysregulation of your thyroid. <clears throat> Excuse me. Amalgams uh, come in all shapes and sizes. Some of them have been in patients' mouths for decades. Decades. Some I've seen people who are in their 60s that have mercury fillings in their mouth from high school that were placed in high school. So um, it was introduced shortly after the Civil War. A lot of dentists were opposed to the use of a material containing elemental mercury two inches from the brain. And yet I, I, can, I can say, uh, uh, very embarrassed to say that in dental school, they told me the mercury was magically locked in. I didn't believe it. And I'm proud to say in 40 years of dentistry, I never placed a dental amalgam filling from the time I left dental school. I knew it was a bad material. I knew it had to have ill effects. And I knew that seeing amalgams like this one on the lower left with all of these holes that this percolation uh, of the metal um, had to release mercury into the body. That was demonstrated again um, when I was on the Dr. Oz show in 2011, um, we demonstrated uh, with a mercury vapor analyzer just from toothbrushing how mercury comes out. But the greatest of mercury, the greatest amount of mercury comes out um, when they're removed. So they need to be removed safely. We use a smart protocol in our practice, which is safe mercury amalgam removal technique. So smart is the right way to take amalgam out because that mercury is released into the environment if it's not contained with a safe protocol, which incidentally exposes dentists, dental staff, and the entire dental office um, to levels of mercury vapor that if OSHA were to measure them would shut the dental office down just as a classroom would be closed or even a school if mercury, if a thermometer is dropped and mercury um, is on the floor of the classroom. Um, so it is your, your amalgams, your silver fillings uh, are not silver. They're 52% mercury and 26% silver. The amount of, this is from the World Health Organization, by the way, but um, and 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 it, the um, you know even in 2003, the World Health Organization stated that dental amalgam constitutes a significant source of exposure to elemental mercury, and uh, and the amounts that people are exposed to are sometimes very very harmful. Um, the amount that's in your seafood is that blue wedge. Um, other food is there, and then you have coal-fired power plants. Um, with air and water, those are negligible compared to the amount of mercury um, that humans are exposed to from dental amalgam fillings. So let's talk about the damage from this. The, the biologic damage, damage from amalgam is twofold. The mercury vapor passes through your cell membranes across the blood-brain barrier, and it causes immunological, neurological, and psychological problems. Um, incidentally, when I came out of dental school, uh, dentists had the highest rate of suicide and depression, um, a, a really sobering statistic that dentists had the highest rate of suicide. And I started to think about that. And yes, you have patients who are afraid to be in the chair and there's a transference, um, counter-transference of all of this emotional, um, you know, psycho-emotional um, 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 information. And, um, but Dentists who work with dental amalgam, you know, are breathing this in every day. And there's all kinds of neurological problems and psychological problems that dentists have, not just on the, um, uh, there's uh, Parkinsonism. I know two dentists with Parkinson's, um, multiple sclerosis, and a lot of other debilitating neurological problems. And the reason is, you know, when you have a toxic load of mercury, um, eventually it, it will cause, and now we've even noticed um, that there's genetic variations that accelerate um, this, um, the cause of 
<clears throat> excuse me, neurological, psychological, and even immuno, immunological uh, problems, gut problems. So mercury is leaching into your saliva, being swallowed. It's in the digestive tract. I cannot tell you how many people that I have cleaned up dental amalgams in their mouth and their um, gut issues resolved and their dysregulation of their immune system, dysregulation of their thyroid, which is very sensitive to heavy metals. So your brain is a primary target for heavy metals, which results in many neurological problems. So mercury overload <clears throat> has been linked to neurological conditions such as Alzheimer's and dementia. And by the way, blood tests don't show the level of mercury toxicity you have. It's really, you know, uh, mercury does not stay in your bloodstream. It goes into cells and it goes past the blood vein barrier. So if you get a blood test and you have high mercury, you're really loaded or it's transient and you were exposed to a lot of it. But what you really want to see is um, a, a provocative urinalysis test, which needs to be done carefully. And, you know, hair analysis will show more mercury that is already been lodged into tissues in the body. So blood tests are not really an accurate determinant. So um, mercury does indeed um, play a role in Alzheimer's disease. And this was a study from the Journal of Alzheimer's disease um, uh, a while ago. We knew this. And, um, and what we found is that trace amounts of mercury can be very, very damaging. Um, to the nerve characteristics of the damage in Alzheimer's disease. And this was research conducted at the University of Calgary uh, that showed that exposure to mercury actually um, supported the formation of neurofibrillar tangles. Those are one of two diagnostic markers for Alzheimer's disease. And other research showed the formation uh, of amyloid plaques. And, um, and, and what's interesting is that other elements, which or have been known as uh, uh, dangerous, like aluminum exposure, um, they only found mercury caused the damage consistent with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this was a documentary you could look up online. It's a really good documentary on the history of, of dental amalgams. It's called Evidence of Harm. Um, and a, a really well done uh, documentary looking at all of the issues surrounding this problem. But we really need to get this out of our mouths and get dentists to stop using it. Now, this um, nearly 40% of dentists still do uh, amalgam fillings. Um, other sources of metals, let's look at that. So, very often you can have these crowns that have metal, they're metal thimbles with porcelain baked on top. And these were older, many times bridges were made. The metal kept the bridge from breaking because the porcelains they had were not strong enough to support a missing tooth. So they put metal under it. Um, and then there were crowns made. Um, and in the 1980s, when the price of gold went very high, we started to introduce a lot of non-precious alloys. Gold, as you know, is a precious alloy and not as harmful as non-precious. Non-precious can contain um, lead, nickel, um, and these are um, very, very dangerous because these heavy metals have debilitating effects and um, in in total body health. So, uh, and the reason you know. Uh, we have cadmium and and other uh, and other metals, but nickel chromium uh, was this one over here. Nickel chromium, cobalt chromium, and titanium have now been found to be um, far less uh, uh, safe than we once thought. Um, and uh, this was a study done on a toxicity study with zebrafish. Um, but let's talk about titanium metal implants. Um, I started working with titanium implants in the late 1980s, and we thought it was fantastic uh, because the origin of these implants uh, were actually by a, a Swedish hematologist by the name of Per Ingvar Branemark. He was looking and using, uh, studying bone marrow 
in animals, and he used these titanium cylinders in the femurs. And uh, and when he went to take them out, he saw the bone was growing around them. So then they became adapted to be used in the mouth, and you see these titanium screws in the human bone. And it was, again, you know, this bone growing around it that we thought the body liked it. In fact, what we've discovered after these many years is that it's an inflammatory response. The bone that grows around metal implants is almost like scar tissue bone. And we start to see lots of different issues over time with what well, this is, um, uh, you know, titanium imp implantitis, um, where we have um, this inflammation of the gum and the loss of bone and destruction of the bone over time uh, and the loss of the dental implant. What's more serious is the fact that par particles from the titanium, because saliva it actually is uh, an electrolyte and can cause corrosion of these metal implants in the mouth with particles from these metal implants being found in the liver, the kidneys, and the lungs. Um, and, uh, and so we see this uh, titanium oxide layer coming off and metal particles being distributed throughout the body. Um, studies uh, have shown that 100% of metal implants um, produce endotoxins. Endotoxins are bacteria and bacterial byproducts. Another study from Germany even showed that the metal implants with cell phones being held up to your ear um, on the side of the dental implant can um, act as an antenna, especially with 5G, causing harmful heat and heating of the jaw and break down. And we really don't even know what the implications of that are, but we know that it is harmful. Um, but the long-term implications are, are serious. So we are moving away from titanium. And, and I'm going to say clearly, you know, we often have to make compromises and decisions. If you have dental implants, I recommend getting a cone beam. Um, I read these cone beams all the time. You're more than welcome to have a virtual consult by Zoom. And I could look at it and give you an evaluation of whether the dental implants are failing or breaking down and whether they should remain um, if they're not um, uh, in an advanced state of breakdown or whether uh, they should be removed and replaced with ceramic uh, implants. So we see the cause of release of particles, chemical corrosion, surface wear. And again, I was speaking about saliva as an electrolyte. By the way, fluoride also causes corrosion of the dental implants. So zirconium implants have many advantages. And among them, um, you can see here's the metal implant, here's the zirconia implant. And this is sort of the evolution of the implant. 1980s, we had all metal. Then we started using these were uh, UCLA abutments where we were able to put a ceramic top on the metal implant. So this middle option is better than the option on the left. And we're starting to look at all ceramic. And, and that option is still, you know, we're still, um, it's certainly more biocompatible. It's more difficult to restore. A lot of dentists have problems restoring these. And so continue to stay in favor of the metal implants as we develop um, more components. My practice, we've been developing all kinds of prosthetic attachments that help us do beautiful aesthetic restorative cases with zirconia or implants. So the advantages of zirconia or what we call ceramic implants, and zirconia actually is even considered a, a white metal, um, but we see higher biocompatibility, definitely more hygienic, superior soft tissue, gum tissue acceptance. They look a heck of a lot better um, under the gums. Uh, and they do not conduct electric charges. They do not corrode. They're far more attractive. And we have been finding a lower risk of infection. Mm -hmm.